Uh, I am going to shift gears now and introduce our next and final, oh, no, yeah, our final session for the day. Uh, it's been pretty amazing to, to hear all the content from today. And I'm going to welcome back to the stage, uh, the virtual stage, if you will, uh, Katie Gross, our chief customer officer, uh, who's going to walk everyone through uh, the next panel. Uh, she'll be joined by uh, Lori Herman from Mondelez and Abby Finnis from PepsiCo. And they're going to be talking a little bit about how they're preparing their insights program for next year. Uh, sit tight and your browser is going to refresh once again. And Katie will be joined by our esteemed panel to start the next session. So thank you so much. Okay, I believe we've had everybody joining us. So I am going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the State of the Consumer panel for today. So this panel is designed to take a look back at the disruption that we all experienced in 2020 and how we can all forge ahead into 2021. I'm Katie Gross. I'm the Chief Customer Officer here at Suzy, and I'm joined on the virtual stage by two wonderful insights leaders. And I'll allow them both to introduce themselves. So we'll start with you, Abby. Hi, so thanks for having me, Abby Finnis. I lead the Portfolio Insights and Analytics team for the US beverage business at PepsiCo. We create and scale capability, tools, solutions across short-term and long-term consumer demand planning for the PB&A organization. So happy to be here. Thanks, thanks Abby. Um, how about you, Laurie? Hi, everybody. I'm Lori Herman. Also excited to join Abby and Katie this afternoon. I work for Mondelez International and I lead the White Space Insights and Analytics team. Uh, we look for growth opportunities for Mondelez, either organic or inorganic growth. Um, and in the past couple of years, a big, big effort has been put forth in uh, bringing on some portfolio companies through acquisition and uh, that was our inorganic growth. So I now have the, the pleasure and the privilege to work more closely with those companies to ha help them drive their growth strategies as well. Awesome. So fun to have you both here. So we're going to kickstart with a, uh, a pretty large question. What have you been your key learnings about in Consumer Insights in 2020? And how is that preparing you for 2021? And Abby, we'll start with you. Sure. Great. It's Something I love talking about, and I always start by saying, luckily, I think we were on the journey before COVID hit us, and we're really just called to accelerate everything we're already doing. So I think number one is just finding more agile and more human ways to stay in touch with and keep a pulse on the consumer. And I mean, boy, has that saved us um, <laughs> with what's been going on for the last six months. And really, we've just been put at you know, the center of so many more organization discussions and being able to advocate and, and show up for the Consumer Citricity Initiative at PepsiCo has been really powerful. So I think agility and just, you know, keeping it real as we try to, to monitor and keep a pulse on consumers. So I know, Katie, you said, um, don't ask what you can observe. So I think that was something we were already doing and, and what more speedy way than to combine that with really quick turn agile survey solutions. Um, and so I, I think those are the main things that have accelerated for us. Yeah, that's wonderful. And Laurie, how has that been for you guys? You know, I, I think since March, it's been quite an interesting time for all of us, clearly. Um, I think, you know, on my end, I had some initiatives in the works and some research plans and the reality was we needed to pause what we were doing. You know, it wasn't really the right time or place to be talking to consumers or having them evaluate our innovations or, or taste our products because they weren't leaving their homes. They weren't going to facilities to do this type of work and qualitative research. So there was a bit of a pause, I'd say, for a lot of the work um, that we've done. Um, but then also needing to adapt how we reach consumers and, um, you know, anything that we were planning to do in person that was qualitative, we we quickly modified and adapted and did all of, we're still even doing all of our qual virtually and, you know, really figuring out how do we reach consumers, where they are, get the learning that we need in the most um, realistic way and, um, you know, 
since things have started opening up, we continue to kind of adapt how we do things. And, um, you know, we're now maybe in facilities again, doing, you know, controlled, uh, you know, testing, but, um, you know, I think as we emerge, as the winter is you know, upon us and, and don't know what's really forthcoming, I think we're going to have to continue to adapt how we do things and, you know, be prepared for uh, constant changing. Yeah, for sure. And I think you, you both mentioned um, before to me that it's about looking at consumers as people again and that human aspect rather than just consumers of a category. Yeah. It's about the human element also. So with that said, what have been some of the largest shifts that you've seen in consumer behaviors within your categories? Laurie, obviously a very successful category this year. I know myself, I've eaten every flavor of Oreo there has been. What kind of shifts have you seen in your consumers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, snacking in of any industry right now, there's a lot, a lot of snacking happening. Um, you know, when the pandemic really was in full force and we were all quarantining and we were all home, I mean there was um, probably more of a shift, as you can imagine, to more indulgent snacking, more comfort seeking. Um, yes, lots of Oreo consumption, lots of Chips Ahoy consumption. And even on our crackers businesses, saw quite a lot of um, growth from consumers. You know, they were not just, um, you know, in consuming them, but actually stocking up a bit as well. So we saw a lot of stocking up behavior from consumers, which, you know, not just the toilet paper that you couldn't find or the hand sanitizer, but, you know, these more indulgent things that consumers could kind of look to something that was maybe familiar to them, like growing up and therefore is a comforting, you know, product for them. Um, we saw a lot of, you know, growth for those brands and those categories, um, you know, and I think just now, you know, months later, we're starting to see a bit of a shift back towards, you know, wanting to eat health, healthy, you know, healthier or just having um, that mindset of, you know, better for you, you know, versus truly indulging all the time. So it's been interesting to see the evolution. And I think it's, you know, what we, what you see can happen in any kind of a tragic situation. And um, it's not necessarily just a pandemic, but uh uh, you know, that you see this kind of indulgent behavior. But anyway, um, mm -hmm. that's what I'm seeing as, you know, kind of most interesting from a consumer behavior in my categories. Yeah, wonderful. I think as we all went into winter and started to put our jeans on again, I realized how much we <laughs> overindulged. <laughs> overindulged. Um, Abby, how has that been for you over at uh, Pepsi? What have been those big consumer shifts you've seen this year? Yeah, I mean, really similar for carbonated soft drink business is Lori, um, and we are seeing the shift now to more of the, the no calorie options um, with the COVID-15, I think, hitting a lot of us. Um, you know, the interesting part, too, for us in, in that enjoyment space is just the immediate shift to a lot of those occasions coming in home when food service outlets were shut down and consumers truly couldn't go there. So we've, we've really tried to help make the most of and and bring those enjoyment occasions that have traditionally been out of home in home um, so whether it's helping put on concerts or partnering with our food service um, customers and in, in running some special programming i think the other really interesting thing has just been what's happened with energy so you know while you know to some extent caffeine and the role of that has been a bit muted um, you do see just sophisticating and different energy needs to help consumers transition throughout the day because routines are sort of shot you don't have the typical get up from your desk or drive somewhere um, to help break up the day and transition your mind and prepare for the next thing so i think we're seeing a lot of opportunity in helping with that and if, if you haven't seen look up our new drip well product. Um, it's not, you know, we're not going to do a full plug for it, but it's also tapping into a really interesting space of helping relax. I think we can all relate to carrying um, a bit more stress than usual. So, you know, that product taps into how do we help consumers unwind. So that's a, one of the areas on the energy spectrum we've seen really emerging. Um, but yeah, yeah. as my, as my, own Susie team knows I'm a huge caffeine drinker uh, with all the energy drinks you you can name under the sun um, and you're right it's, it used to be that that commute to work that would always lead to that can of rockstar being purchased etc and now it's more about the getting myself ready for the next zoom meeting and that kind of mental um, energy that's necessary 
So changing track slightly, how did you leverage, you mentioned agility, um, Abby, earlier, how have you leveraged agile insights tools like Simile, like Susie to kind of help you navigate through this uh, through this crazy work, year we've had? Sorry. I mean, and thank you for bringing back up my comment on, it has been just great to watch the organization care about people as people, not just consumers of our category. That's so important. And I didn't stress that at the beginning, but that's really where my team sits um, because we're portfolio team, our first job is to represent people at scale. Um, and with that, what we've done is had to make choices and really consolidate our tools. So I would say a really interesting and powerful tool we discovered this year was um, foot traffic data, which we actually use to both, um, you know, watch reemergence as areas have opened, as well as really pragmatically message to the organization recovery of some of our e-customer channels. And Susie has been a great complement to that because it's allowed us to, with great speed, which is whatever, no one's patient these days, with great speed be able to answer and shed really specific insight on whether it's a specific target group, living in a specific area, participate in a specific behavior, turn around and answer in a perspective to that to help a company, you know, a narrative or explain business performance that we're seeing. So we've, I mean, honestly, we're feeling Susie's every week, if not multiple times a week to help feed the messaging that we push out um, to executives, to our marketing teams, uh, to help keep a pulse on what's going on. That's great. And thank you for, for working with us so closely. It's really important, though, that you mentioned that that foot traffic data that you're looking at as well to keep a track on what's happening. And and as we've said no, a number of times now, you know, always only only ask what you can't observe. And so to be able to pair that data together is really important. Laurie, how has that been for you? How have you leaned into ad yeah. models in 2020? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, this is actually the first year that I've been working with Susie and have been thrilled at the ability to um, you know, anytime I need, get the answers that I need from the right consumers that I need them to answer. Um, but one example I think actually is, um, has been really, really helpful just given the environment we're in. Um, you know, we saw a lot of consumers stocking up on products, like I mentioned, and, you know, it was really important to us to understand um, kind of longitudinally are consumers actually consuming those products that they stocked up on maybe in March, April, so that we could anticipate and, um, you know, manage expectations, manage our forecasts, you know, manage our inventory, but, you know, understand are consumers actually consuming the products that they, um, that they had purchased. So we fielded um, monthly Susie questions to understand uh, among the same consumers. So we retargeted the people that we knew stocked up. They indicated that, you know, bought the things that we were interested in and then, you know, kind of monitored them over a few months um, to understand, you know, again, how much depletion there was in the products that they purchased. So that was just such a, an unanticipated usage of Susie that, you know, going in really didn't think that was going to be the topics I was going to be, you know, using it for. Um, and also one of my colleagues who I saw in the chat is on who manages our seasonals business. She's also been leveraging it to understand consumers attitudes and, and, you know, anticipated behaviors during the holidays. So I think that was, you know, a few months ago, we were already talking to consumers about Halloween so that we could really understand, hey, what are you thinking you're going to be doing? Do you believe, you know, you'll be trick or treating? And, you know, so it was just another really interesting way that I didn't anticipate us to be using Susie, but it's helping us get the information that we need. Yeah, that's great. So many of our clients are leveraging that ability to recontact those same consumers so they can track them over time. It's so key right now. I can definitely confirm I ate all the cookies I stopped up, stocked up on. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, and so with that said, actually, so for both of your companies, obviously, you've, you've both experienced some brands who've had exceptional growth in 2020. And I'm sure you're having to kind of prepare for increased pressure to maintain that growth within your categories or within your companies within 2021. So how are you kind of balancing that uh, that need for kind of sustained growth on certain brands or how are you addressing 2021's forecasts? Difficult question. <laughs> I'll start with you, Laurie. Looks like Abby was ready to jump in if you yeah, wanted. Go ahead. I'm happy to go. 
Oh, sure. Yeah. No, um, we, no, no, I looked like you were ready to speak, but <laughs> Sorry. I mean, an area that we're really thinking a lot about is just the role of innovation and, and, and within that, the role of channels. Um, I mean, it's hard to ignore, I think channel planning now more than ever. And again, being able to bring the consumer observations and insights to that process has been really fun. Um, because how how can you forecast that if you don't start with the consumer? There's just no trend line to help you. But um, just with the penetration of e-commerce now um, and, you know, just the change and what a shopper's trip looks like to our traditional channels. I mean, I think we're really thinking about where to best meet particular moments of demand so we can give, you know, meet consumers with their their new needs and do it in the right place where they're in the right mindset and they want to have that moment of discovery and, and try new products. Um, you know, I think for our core businesses, it's, you know, when are things going to return to normal more in terms of mix? So again, uh, we've been bringing the consumer voice to that, but things, I mean, we talked to Katie before about the big shift to multi-packs. I mean, that was an inorganic <laughs> event. Um, mm -hmm. So just really trying to figure out that aspect of things, which can have a big impact on profitability, just like channels. But I, I mean, we're very optimistic and we have an aggressive innovation pipeline. So like I said, that's a lot of what we're trying to just orchestrate across the right channel architecture. Yeah. What yeah, no, and I agree. Just to build on what you said too, I think it's really understanding the consumer, understanding um, their mindset and where they, um, you know, where we believe they'll be, you know, sitting and um, so that we can ensure that we're communicating to them in the right way with the right messaging that's really empathetic and, and showing that we understand their situations and what they're looking for, their needs, and that we're offering the right, you know, mix of products to them. And, uh, you know, so I do think it's really always is comes back to really understanding who your consumer is and, you know, any of their unmet needs and the occasions during which they use your products and is that shifting and how do we have to adapt for that and ensure we have the right product in the right place at the right time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and just to build on that, what you brought up is so important. Just again, so, so many of these dynamics were already with us. They just became much more acute, right? With everything we face, but just this idea of like hyper regionalization and personalization of experiences and, how do you forecast that? I mean, it's changed yeah. our approach. We now forecast the outcome of this at a household level, right? And that changes the customer discussions we're having and how do we support you regionally? It's just everything has gotten so personal that again, it calls for the voice of the consumer. And then it's just a question of how do we partner to, to meet and, and bring our empathy and our programming in the right way, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, that's it. There's so many different parts of the country experiencing this in such a different way that it's it's no longer kind of one size fits all. There was, actually was a question for the audience. Um, does Mondelez feel it can make Americans healthier, uh, maybe potentially more food secure again? Um, I know, Laurie, your, your team have been doing a lot of research around healthy snacking. Yeah. If you're able to share any of that. Sure. I mean, Mondelez's strategy is all about snacking made right. And we have a lot of initiatives underway that are uh, really trying to educate and, uh, you know, bring the right products to consumers and educate them about mindful snacking. And, uh, you know, I feel like the fact that our everything that we stand for is in support of consumers snacking made right journeys. I think, you know, I'm extremely optimistic that we do have the ability to guide consumers towards, you know, um, eating in, in the most appropriate way, knowing that indulgence is a part of that. You know, you're never going to get away from having something that you really crave because then you'll be, you know, depriving yourself. So we really believe that there's that balance of, you know, eating across the spectrum. And, um, but again, everything is all about our mindful snacking and snacking made right strategy. So. Yeah, for sure. And you've both mentioned multi-packs, and actually a lot of our clients are doing a lot of research on multi-packs right now. Interestingly enough, where most companies assumed it was uh, hygiene related, it's actually more about variety and those consumers want that mm -hmm. change of flavor mm -hmm. or taste um, rather than just having smaller packs for, for um, 
for health and safety reasons. Yeah. So speaking of indulgence, we have a lot of occasions coming up in the next couple of months. So Halloween, mm. Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Christmas, and of course, all of these occasions are so key for food and beverage companies. I couldn't even begin to imagine how you're starting to forecast, adapt, plan for those kind of up and coming occasions. Um, I'd love to kind of dive into some more information there. Abby, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I mean, it It all starts with the consumer. <laughs> and I would say, <laughs> you know, trying to slow down on predicting everything too far in advance, right? Which I think the organization's calling for. And yes, it's important to have a pulse on the latest outlook from the consumer, but creating that agility with our customers within within our organization to be able to react to whatever we're faced with at that point in time. I think what, what seems known is that the look and feel of celebrations is going to change. So they're going to be smaller. Everyone's we see circles are shrinking and, you know, sometimes that's actually turned out to be, as consumers would say, a good thing. So, um, you know, with smaller circles, with venues coming in home and consumers still trying to preserve what's important for them, what we've been trying to do was get a, get a handle on that and almost figure out how we can codify. And again, it gets down to different cohorts, different regions, the, just different consumers and help them preserve the traditions, the recipes, the celebratory mm -hmm. moments to the extent we can. And that's partnering with our Frito counterparts. It's again, customer relationships, because it's it takes all of us and it's at a community level. So mm -hmm. I think for us, it's more about programming and, and celebrating leaning into communities and personal um, rituals than it, than it is about any you know, specific product um, changes. But yeah, that's great. I don't know what about you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, we, we have a lot of brands that lend themselves to celebratory moments and holidays and, you know, a lot of traditions that are, have been, and I anticipate will remain really, you know, meaningful to consumers. You know, people make Oreo cookie balls at home or like little Oreo truffle balls. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't see that changing and that becoming like that ritualistic part of their holiday season. And uh, we do have some other seasonal products that, you know, again, just really lend themselves to the occasions or the holidays without it really, you know, um, it, so the celebration might be a little bit smaller, but I still believe that the people in the homes um, with their smaller families around are still going to, you know, take part in those types of, um, situ those, you know, rituals or um, traditions. Um, the other, going to say one more thing, but if it comes to me, but one other thing that's exciting to me personally at Mondelez is that one of our newest portfolio companies actually makes um, create a treat gingerbread house kits and cookie decorating kits. And so I've been part partnering with them a lot on trying to, you know, determine, um, you know, how consumers are using these products and how do we get those to be even more meaningful traditions. So that's just an aside. And I'm excited about, you know, having something like that, that can be so meaningful to consumers and touch their lives. Um, but the other thing I was going to say actually is I think because people may not be out and about as much, I think we, our digital efforts are you know really important too, that we're making sure that, you know, the holiday spirit lives on however we reach consumers. And if it's a little bit more on their phones or, you know, devices, then, you know, I think we'll have a lot of programs in place to really make sure that we're connecting our brands and, you know, with consumers during these times. Yeah, absolutely. I've definitely seen in my neighborhood, the, the creativity on the pumpkins this year was out of control. So I can only imagine the creativity mm -hmm. on Christmas cookie decorating is going to be yeah. really good there <laughs> as well. Um, so how have you changed, you know, changing, changing track a little bit, how have you evolved your relationships with your retailers? Um, obviously, there's been that kind of increased shift to towards e-commerce. Um, and how are you sh supporting your Shopper Insights teams throughout this? Abby, do you want to uh, kick off there? I mean, I think, again, it's just been more, more demand, more wanting the voice of the consumer and using, you know, using all of the great assets that we have as, you know, a value add in those partnerships. So, and helping, I mean, how people feel ultimately depends what happens at Shelf and um, how often people are show up at Shelf. So I think it's just been pulling the, the consumer narrative more 
frequently into customer discussions and more casually. I would say, I mean, the sense I get is that we're more in touch with, um, you know, our key, a key account contacts now more than ever because they're looking for help. They're looking for insight. Everyone's trying to feel conviction as to, you know, what to expect and what's going on and how we can partner up to help make lives better and um, recover. Again, back to the communities. I think those are, mm -hmm. I do feel like there's been a change there, a lot more conversation about how how to build programs that support recovery or support whatever whatever part of the curve you're, you're in. So it's just yeah. putting the consumer more in the center of everything, which I mean, is a positive outcome of all of this for, for the function, for sure. Yeah, and I guess it's about you know thinking of them as humans, not just shoppers as well. I know that yeah. we've talked about that um, in the past. Laurie, how is that translating for you for you guys yeah. with your shopper insights teams? Yeah, you know, I mean, actually, a comment on the e-commerce you had mentioned. You know, we've seen since since March, as you all obviously get a lot more home or Instacart where your groceries, you know, you, you select and they deliver, um, where we've seen such a skyrocket in the amount of online purchasing. So, you know, I think for us, it's making sure with our shopper and e-commerce teams that you can, um, consumer interests and making sure that we're offering the right products to deliver on their needs. I think you had said earlier, like multi-packs, we're seeing, you know, one of our biggest um, e-commerce SKUs is, you know, it's not just Oreo, it's actually a package that's got a variety of our cookie brands in it because consumers are really, you know, excited to have that variety. So because we're able to understand, um, you know, what's being purchased and, and you know, even just reading um, reviews online, we can understand what consumers are looking for. It has enabled us to make sure that we're offering the right um, products to to them. Yeah, that's great that you're doing social listening. Also, um, I'm, and we'll come on to that in a second. Actually, so what kind of new tools and methodologies um, did you test in 2020, and which of them are you excited to bring into 2021? Abby, we'll start with you. So I mentioned the foot traffic. Um, I mm -hmm. won't belabor it, but back to the human comment, which is just part of how at least I run my team. Um, it's a really human and real way to to get a, a lot of insight. So it's a pragmatic thing in that you can just monitor how frequently compared to the year prior, consumers are going to all different types of outlets, whether it's parks and recreation or mm -hmm. the grocery store um, or a movie theater if, if there is traffic slowly returning there. Um, and at the same time, you can also overlay restrictions lifting and use that as a, as a really intelligent observation of reemergence, right? So as restrictions lift, how much, how quickly does a population in an area go back out and start returning to activity? So I would say that's been probably um, the most new. We've been doing a lot of social listening, digital scraping with machine learning overlaid, which frankly saved the day for us, I think, just because we do fuel future demand planning for the organization and being able to, again, with conviction say, don't, you know, we've got a pulse on this. You know, this isn't, this isn't completely changing what the outlook look like, but are there attributes and dynamics that have accelerated in a huge way for sure? Are there do-it-yourself habits that we think are gonna have some sticking power and start to show up in a food service account, in a bottle and can? Probably. But because we had some of those things in place, I think, you know, we were we've been able to tap into that. But both of those to me, in that they're they're the more human side of things, have been really helpful. And then I go back to again our partnership with Susie, which was just really furthered throughout all of this and has been our only way to quickly go answer those last remaining dot connecting insights. Um, so that's not going to change either. Um, so I think those are the three things that we will carry forward um, as we fuel for the portfolio, the human insight. Yeah, thank you. And we value the partnership. Thank you. Laurie, what about you? What have you tried that's new for 2020 yeah. that you're excited to carry forward? 
Well, I mean, I this and this wasn't, I don't think this was the intention of this panel discussion. This is not just a praise Susie discussion, but that was one. We'll of, take it. <laughs> it. It actually was one of the tools that was new to my team this year. Um, you know, I decided that based on the type of work I anticipated us needing to do that I felt like it was a critical resource for us to have. And then of course we wound up using it in so many different ways, but I'd say that, that for sure for me is one that um, I am glad we finally, you know, took the leap, so to speak. Um, you know, there weren't honestly too many other new um, methodologies that I personally use. I, it's funny. It's almost, I just kind of thought of that as, you know, the way consumers were kind of really drawn to products they were really familiar with. I wonder if that's why we kind of this year maybe tended to, you know, talk to the same people we've always known. I don't know. But um, what was also really, I thought, a really excellent um, way of the industry coming together this year was actually the proactive um COVID reporting and tracking that was happening. And I can't tell you, I mean, how many reports and, and like ongoing tracking reports that I received from some suppliers and, you know, partners that I've worked with over the years that were really just trying to add value and, you know, help us all through this. Um, so I think for me, that was also another, you know, um, you know, great uh, outcome of, of what was happening this year. Um, and then also just because the nature of my team and we're really immersed in, you know, trends and understanding consumer behavior and what's happening right now. I mean, I think everybody has got their eye to that, but my team, team even more so um, possibly. And, um, you know, we read every single smart brief, every single newsletter, you know, that's sent our way, all the Mintel reports and everything that helps us understand, you know, what's happening. Um, and actually through that, I... Um, I did discover a, a new supplier partner that we did hire actually, you know, in the summer to do some work with us solely based on this newsletter that he writes weekly and, um, you know, being so impressed by the um, insight and the knowledge that this newsletter brought, it brought us to actually, you know, commission a study. So just a quick plug for my friends at Malachite Strategy that we just partnered with, um, you know, if not for a trends newsletter, because of all that was going on in the world right now, I might not have discovered a new way of, um, you know, to working with somebody. So anyway, lots of different thoughts yeah. about, you know, <laughs> what we've done this year and what we'll continue to do. And, um, and you know, it's been an interesting time for sure. Yeah. Uh, that's so great to hear. They're a great team over at Malachi um, also. Um, and I, I'm really proud of them, the insights industry. We all came together this year to produce as much data as we can to kind of share that knowledge. Um, it's more about collaboration, not competition. So it's been really fabulous to see everybody really coming together. We did have a question actually from the audience, which I, I think is probably a good time to ask it now. With families spending more time together during these holiday seasons, how do you think kids play a role in your digital marketing strategy for the whole household? Hmm. Tough one that we didn't rehearse. It did come from the audience. So apologies if I yeah. catch you on your toes there. <laughs> you know, I can speak for, you know, some of our brands. Um, you know, we um, we have some brands that are, you know, more kid oriented. We have Honeymade Grams. We have Teddy Grams. You know, other products that maybe um, you would associate immediately with kids. So, um you know, I don't know that their strategies have changed in any way about how to reach reach the consumer and ultimately the kid, the kids in the house. Um, you know, I think it goes back to, again, like just really understanding like deep empathy of what consumers are going through and doing. And I, I imagine, you know, knowing everybody is at home and knowing that, you know, our time together is maybe more precious now, which is, it's great that we have it, but it also could be stressful. So I imagine, and, you know, I don't honestly work on any of the, you know, big brands that we have in our portfolio, but I imagine there's some acknowledgement of kind of that, the consumer's situations. And, um, but, uh, you know, I don't believe we'd actually be targeting kids in a different way. You know, we do have some policies about, you know, how we target and who we can target. So I don't know that we'd actually be using different means or media to, to reach them. But I think maybe in the messaging and the imagery, I could yep. see some more, you know, family oriented, you know, aspects. Yeah. How does that translate to Pepsi, Abby? 
I mean, similar spot. I really, none of our brands were new. I think we were new to the um, a market where we would ever market anything to kids. So um, we don't really have any scale products where kids would be contemplated in digital strategy. Um, what I would say is with kids being home, you know, there's the reality of what that means to moms um, and families, right? And dads. So that's something we talk a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, and back to just how personal these experiences are. But, you know, what we're hearing from women is just how much harder it is to keep up with fitness. And if it's a working mom, keep up with anything other than work and if you're homeschooling or, I mean, it's just everyone. So we, we think a lot about you know, the, the changing dynamics within your house walls and, and what that means to consumers we are serving and how can we support them and help them. Um, and we've seen some really innovating things like mo moms or dads doing push-ups with their kids on their back. Uh, so they're entertaining their kid, but they're working out. So, I mean, it's just how do we, how do we help um, with that reality? But yeah, we, we wouldn't, they wouldn't be contemplated in our digital marketing. Yeah. Yeah. No sense. And there's actually kind of a similar-ish question. Um, how are you measuring and leveraging your social channels like Instagram and Pinterest to stay connected with consumers, if at all? What's the point now? Are we measuring? Measuring and leveraging your social channels like oh, Instagram measuring. and Pinterest, yeah. I mean, I would say, so we... We have a team, um, we're fortunate at, at Pepsi, I don't, I don't know if every company does, but that monitors our culture presence and does a lot of culture mapping and has culture maps we maintain for brands um, and does various degrees of social listening reporting um, as brands went back online. Cause that, you know, there was a time where we we really, for the most part went, went pretty dark. So going back on was, was, you know, at times I think a bit, bit scary, but we felt that it was also important. So we leaned on them to really help us navigate through that. And, and it looks and feels the answer is different for every brand. But the point being, it's something we we have been very mindful of um, and using leaning on that that culture team that specializes in the social tracking and mapping. Um, we think a lot about culture, um, particularly mm -hmm. with all the social justice stuff going on and, you know, the election coming up. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's going to be a tough road to navigate. So, um, yeah, we need to to keep a pulse on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't have much to build on that either. But um, the only build I would say is, I think with the social platforms like that, we have the ability to so much more quickly um, create a message and get it to the consumers that you know in a meaningful way in a quick fashion. So. Um, you know, I think that's probably how we're leveraging it. Um, you know, even some of the the companies, the, the brands that I work with, you know, I even have seen some collaborative collaborative um, posts from them that I think is mm -hmm. just like a, you know, fortuitous way to <laughs> use the platform. But um, but yeah, I, I have similar tools and ability to monitor, which is really fortunate. Yeah, that's great. So you've both talked about some of the metrics you've been using, um, foot traffic, et cetera, obviously leaning into more agile um, platforms like Suzy's. On the flip side, are there any metrics that you had traditionally followed in the past that have become less relevant during during 2020 and during COVID? Potentially difficult question. Abby, what are your thoughts? I mean, the, the, there are, I don't know that they're less relevant. They're just, um, we know that they're, being impacted by acute factors. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so like something like price elasticity, for example, I was looking at the other day and you know, you can imagine the trend gets into a highly irrational space um, throughout 2020. So there, there's, there are metrics that I think we're, we're choosing to sort of tune out on a bit until things stabilize. Um, yeah. And also just because we've had to bring in so many new measures, right? So, I mean, my team wasn't publishing the latest unemployment numbers or jobless numbers. And mm -hmm. so I think to remove some of the noise and focus on all of the pieces of the business or factors, I should say, impacting the business from outside, we've had to be a bit more selective and curating measures. So I think there it's been by choice. And then there are these anomalies going on that, that we just aren't reacting to. But so I think we've tried to curate just because there's so much else to bring in to try and get a handle on things. But price yeah. elasticity is the one I, I would say I was looking at this week, 
so it's the most top of mind, but I'm sure there, there are others. <laughs> We've spent a lot mm. of time with penetration, I would say, yeah. um, and understanding mm. and pulling apart what all of the households that have come into some of our brands um, throughout this look like okay. and what does that mean to our future with them. Um, so that's been an interesting one on the flip side um, that we're just leaning more into. Yeah. I don't know, Lori. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the analysis that my team has done, we've we've gone back and we've actually just started looking at 2019 data <laughs> just to get a level set on what's happening in this category and just to better understand and then kind of slowly starting to look at what's happening in 2020. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 there's, I guess, that balance of um, trying to make sense of what information we have on hand, what impact is due to COVID, what is naturally, you know, organically happening. Mm -hmm. um, I think the one thing, you know, we'll, we'll continue to always continue to look at are our ROIs. Like, I, I guess, you know, there, that could be an impact. There certainly could be an impact because of, you know, inflated purchasing or whatnot. But, um, you know, because we have such a historical perspective on where things have been, I think that maybe is a way we can, you know, understand what we're seeing now, but start to anticipate what we think the, um, you know, future may look like. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting question for sure. And I, I do struggle all the time, you know, I don't know, should we be looking at this or not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's so many new measures to come in. As you mentioned, you know, the unemployment rates is probably something the average market researcher mm -hmm. wasn't monitoring daily and is now, you know, becoming a, a daily measure. Um, so thinking about, we, we've talked a lot about new tools coming in, new measures being looked at and so on. For the future of market research, and we spoke about this a little bit on my panel this morning also, um, how do you think, well, what kind of new skills do you think need to come into market research and what might the future of careers in market research um, really mean? I know, Abby, this is a very passionate area um, that, that you maybe want to sh kind of share with us. Yeah, I mean, and I, I feel that I can say this as I, I think I'm an old timer in the industry. So I grew up, um, you know, using very traditional methodologies. And for, I mean, even pre-COVID, I think there were signs, but again, everything being more acute now, you just can't ignore, I think everything is going to change. So honestly, I think the harder question to answer is what's going to stay the same. And I say that not to sound dramatic or scary, but to hopefully inspire those that are curious and love that and love the freedom to answer questions and drive a business forward using any and all data you can collect or create, right? So I've got people who are passionate about math and data engineering and running empathy programs on my team versus, you know, I don't recruit anymore for have you fielded, you know, 30 plus uh, creative tests or concept screens or home use tests. I think it's more seeking agility, being curious, having a passion to connect, simplify data to provide mm -hmm. answers and increase the velocity of good decision-making, really. I mean, that's how we talk about my team at Pepsi. Um, so, I mean, and we talk about it all the time on my team. Like, we can't we can't be afraid. We've got to just become multidimensional um, people that are here to fuel better decision-making and go find new tools, go find new data, mm -hmm. try it. Um, so you, you've just got to be curious. You've got to be, you know, willing to take risks and connect information and um, architect it together. Uh, that's another term we use a lot. I think architects um, will become quite valuable to the future of the function. Yeah, I love mm -hmm. that data architect style that are kind of the skills needed for the future. Laurie, what are your thoughts on the future of skills that's needed yeah. for research? You know, I mean, I love that. I, I um, don't disagree at all. I, I maybe because I'm, I don't know, probably an old timer as well and have a, you know, a college degree in psychology. And I just can't help but be curious about why consumers do what they do and, um, you know, trying to understand how to translate what they're saying and doing and really just getting at the heart of what they're all about to then identify what's really going to delight them or meet their unmet needs. And so for me, I think we'll never get away from needing to get to that deep consumer understanding and, um, you know, really enabling us to anticipate 
consumer needs, get ahead of trends, create these trends, um, you know, understand that not everybody's the same. And, you know, there's, uh, it's a big country with a lot of diversity, you know, um, economically, ge geographically, obviously, but dem demographically. And, you know, I just, I think understanding how these people are different um, and similar to mm -hmm. determine how we can best communicate to them and bring the right products to them. So I don't know, I always go to the heart of like, you know, just wanting to understand consumers and um, maybe it makes me a little old fashioned. Not that I think, you know, it's not important, but I think, you know, I, I love a good qualitative session with people <laughs> too. Yeah, and I should say, I should say architecture, but yeah. yeah, I think so it's, it's architecting data to unlock time, honestly, to build yeah. empathy. Because yeah. if, if we don't change some, bring some simplicity mm -hmm. to using data, I think the time to mm -hmm. actually become more empathetic marketers isn't, it's not there. So I didn't mean to imply that's on, we actually run of the course. program for PBNA on my team. But, um, and, and one of the things we talk about is if we become data only, we run the risk of being party to dehumanizing marketing. But I think right. we we have to something has to give, or you don't you don't have the time. So how do we architect data, and how what are the best ways to build empathy and, and connect with people yeah. in a way totally. for sure? Yeah, absolutely. And and on one of the questions from the audience, Javier asked if you know, do we think that some of the traditional analysis tools I won't name the name, um, but do you think they're going to maintain relevance or be replaced by simpler tools i partly think that the question is is also related to how can that play into us connecting those dots um, and how can we help automate some of that and yeah, i'm a little old school market researcher myself and actually remember having to turn a lot of spss data tables into powerpoint presentations and that was the early part of my career and then rapidly on a sunday night like oh my god i put some insights together what this actually might mean instead of spending the time right you know collecting the data um and so on yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, my sense, ahead, like, yes, yeah, software aside would be that mm -hmm. I, my sense is it would have to change. I mean, just given um, all of the solutions and working in the open right. technology wise, that's just advancing so quickly um, and, and right. just sitting over and creating data lakes, first party data. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just the whole landscape of data, I think, is going to change so quickly. Yeah. So I think data and empathy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what yeah. you, what you <laughs> call that. Um, that seems we'll like have to come up with a good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I know a lot of companies are bringing in new data scientists. We're very lucky we have a new data scientist joining us at Suzy also. But it's not just about what data can they pull in, but what questions should we even be asking in the first place? And then how do we frame that story afterwards? And I think those will be the best data scientists, not necessarily the most technical, um, you know, technically ex experts, uh, but more, the, do they know what questions we should be asking? What should we be mining mm -hmm. in this data set in the first place? Mm -hmm. So we have a couple more minutes just before we, we finally wrap up. What advice would you have for other insights leaders as you plan for 2021? So kind of final thoughts. Um, Abby, we'd love to start with you. I mean, I think one would be this, this notion of, you know, seizing the day and and keeping the human voice and consumer centric narrative in your organization. Um, and so not letting go of the seat many of us, I think, have gotten. And the way to do that, I believe, is to just keep pushing out very real time, easy to digest human content that is relevant to multiple stakeholders. So again, we talked about, you've got to resonate with the folks over customers. You've got to resonate with people trying to change our category forecast. You've got to resonate with marketers. So how do we keep the, the role in the, the broader narrative that I think this has afforded many of us? And then just faster, more agile. I mean, we, I've, I've, pretty pretty ruthlessly i would say curated the vendors we work with just out of desperation i mean there's yes there are so many reports but sometimes too much just becomes a distraction so i think we've we've made some choices um and i i like having a thinner set of partners or a leaner set of partners to really um to really be with so i think continuing to build kind of 
with, with fewer partners and, and in housing um, when appropriate or probably, because that just fosters agility. So I think just keeping the role we've gotten, put the, put the consumer first, the human first, the person first, whatever you want to call it, um, and then just stay agile and um, build for that and, and keep building into to the tools that you've chosen, created, mm -hmm. those would be my thoughts. Yeah, I love that. Laurie, any final thoughts that you can share with us? Sure. Yeah, you know, I would say, I think Abby said it earlier, um, you know, stay curious, stay interested in understanding what's going on in this world. I mean, I, I, my team knows we get, again, a ton of smart briefs, newsletters, whatever you want to call them. Um, and I, I, some days I'm so busy and I want to just go delete, but I don't. I actually go through them and really think about, oh, how might this impact what I'm, you know, involved with. So stay curious for sure. Um, to understand what's happening in the world. But also I would say experiment, you know, I might not have done a hugely great job this year of experimenting with a lot of different methodologies or approaches, but a couple at least that I've now added to the toolbox that I think, you know, will enable me, my team, and even Mondelez, um, you know, broadly will benefit from, you know, learning and, and doing things better, different, you know, just, um, you know, I guess if you always kind of do the same thing, I don't know what that's saying, like, yeah. <laughs> you're never gonna, not gonna try to get to that quote. But anyway, you know what I'm trying to say. So yeah. I think um, experimentation to the extent that it makes sense, not just experimenting for experimentation sake, but, um, you know, tied into that, you know, being curious to learn and try new things, I think has made us, you know, a bit more um, impactful this year. Yeah. And I will say too, on that note, these industry <clears throat> events being virtual, I don't know if the audience yes. or anyone can relate. I feel so much more connected to the best up and coming vendors, which has really enabled our agenda this year. So I couldn't agree more, like find the best of the best and make sure that's who you're working with um, and, and make some tough, tough calls along the way. But I mean, I love, mm -hmm. I love discussions like this and I can't say I was doing as many of them when it involved no. travel or, you know, I had to commute, like this is found time. So it's really, it's really great to hear and, and talk with other professionals. So thanks for setting it up. Definitely. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah um, I completely agree with you. I think, you know, originally the virtual events kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss seeing my friends' faces. I'm going to miss everybody in the bar. But actually, you know, platforms like this where you can actually, I can see everybody in the chat bar as well, all our kind of friends um, in the chat feature and be able to kind of really foster this uh, this type of conversation is is so key. And it obviously it's going to continue into 2021 as well. Thank you both so yeah. much. I'm going to hand back to um, our president, RV, who will wrap up for the day. But thank you so much, Laurie and Abby. It's always Thank wonderful. you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Amazing. Wonderful to chat. <laughs> um, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Abby. Amazing uh, conversation. Really appreciate your time today. Um, and thanks to all of our participants um, who, uh, who spent their afternoon with us. Uh, some incredible content. And most of all, uh, thanks to each and every one of you attending our sessions today uh, and joining us for this inaugural uh, State of the Consumer Summit. We know that your time is incredibly valuable and we're grateful that you chose to spend it with us today. I hope that you found some of our content helpful and that you walked away a little more inspired. With that, once again, I'm Avi Savar. I'm the president of Suzy. On behalf of myself and everyone at Suzy, thank you very much. We can't wait to host you during our future webcast. Please visit suzy.com to learn more about what we do. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter to get insights delivered to your inbox and follow us on social media so we can stay connected. Until next time, cheers. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.